first of all, it's my pleasure to be here. It's um, now 3.04 in the morning or 5.04 in the morning. So I should be very articulate as I, as I present right now. I've had a lot of coffee, so I might speed up at any moment. So be fair with me. Um, I'm here to present the START model, but also to talk about policy in the United States in terms of uh, people with intellectual developmental disabilities and mental health service needs. <clears throat> I want to say that we don't call them, or my team does not refer to people as dual diagnosed or duly diagnosed, or um, we, we, don't, our, we don't frame them in terms of their diagnosis. Um, what we try to do um, is really talk about mental health service experiences and the mental health aspects of um, what you call learning disabilities and intellectual disabilities or developmental disabilities, because everybody actually has mental health needs, every human, including people with learning disabilities. And what it isn't unique or different um, to have uh, mental health needs um, to, and uh, as a result of cognitive issues, what we are trying to learn together is to have a better understanding of how to communicate with people around those issues, diagnose and treat them effectively. So it's really not that they are challenging, but we, are, we have challenged them through a lack of understanding and competent care. And Angela has been my colleague and friend in doing this work for about 200,000 years. We've been together um, in talking about this, give or take a year or two, I, I would say. It's been a long time. And while I will articulate some progress being made, there's a lot of issues still outstanding. The model that I developed called START, and I'm going to share my screen now um, to share my slides. Um, say what? That's how you're fine. But I'm doing fine. Yeah, yeah. I have a lot of help here, and I just need to tell everyone I'm doing fine. Recording in progress. Whoops. Okay. The project is called START. Um, what's really interesting about START is I, I began this project with a psychiatrist named Robert Sovner in 1988. We thought we were going to put ourselves out of business. Um, it is a crisis intervention model. Um, and we felt that um, with good preventative care, diagnostic and treatment um, issues, we would be able to convince the world in the world in the United States to do better so that people would benefit. Unfortunately, um, START has expanded rather than retracted. We're in many states across the United States. And to me, it's a success of the model, but also reflects how much, how much further we need to go um, in doing this work. I, I just want to remind us all that we've done very well in disability policy. And in the United States, um, we've had the Americans with Disabilities Act. Can I just hold this? Yeah. I'm going to hold this. I just wanted everybody's permission before I did. <laughs> um, oh, by the way, I'm funny. So if you're laughing out loud out there, go for it. Oh, and I want to recommend the, the British Bake Off musical. It's very funny. And I just sort of wanted to give it a plug. I saw it yesterday. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act in the US, um, a, an act is an act of the Constitution. So basically, what we're saying is that it's your constitutional right to have access to accommodation for people with disabilities. <clears throat> and actually, it's a violation of your civil rights not to have accommodation of your disability. Um, and what resulted in that was a lawsuit um, by disability rights in the United States, which is called Olmstead, and that helped to pave the way. So we had the act. And then we had the lack of response that resulted in the lawsuit that reinforced and encouraged states to do better with people with disabilities. Um, and one of and the requirements that resulted from Olmstead included active treatment in facilities and hospitals. So we had people stuck in mental hospitals who were basically warehoused. Um, in fact, I don't think they were any different from prisons. In fact, in some places, people were called inmates. When I started working in the field um, in 1972, I was a volunteer at Willowbrook State School in New York City, and the people who resided there were actually called inmates. So 
the, our beliefs about people were that they needed to be managed and held and housed because they had no capacity to live in the community. I mean, that was really where it was. So that why, why require active treatment if there's no progress to be made? And so um, what the Olmstead Act said was in fact, there are ways to provide active treatment and that you have to include people with intellectual developmental disabilities, which is what I'm going to be referring to people that you would also use different terminology as Angela said in the remedies and that there needs to be community-based services and that those need to be expanded. However, we continue to segregate the intellectual developmental disability services from the mental health services as if you would, you would believe that the, there are two distinct populations, a mental health population and an IDD population. And people with IDD were not viewed as capable of benefiting from mental health services. So we had more work to be done. So Olmstead happened soon after Dr. Sagner and I developed the START model, it was in the early 1990s, we, we developed START in 1988. And this is what the START model looks like. Um, I, can't, I have to be able to read this. Can you reduce the humans on the screen? Yeah, we, I don't mean to reduce the humans. I mean, you know. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Now you go back. Reduce the humans. What kind of a phrasing is that? But start as a crisis prevention and intervention model that focuses on community languages. Any of you who are aware of Buckminster Fuller and the concept of synergy, it's a mathematical truth that if you blend and link together, you will have more resources and greater capacity. That siloing actually reduces capacity and, and actually wastes resources, which is sort of, I was telling Angela, my PhD is in policy, mental health policy. I'm very interested in how to do better and also be respectful of accountability with regard to resources. So the STAR model is designed to fill the gaps and build capacity rather than setting up a segregated system like an IDD MH system versus an IDD system or a distinct mental health system. And this is what the model looks like. In blue, you'll see um, the services that are developed by this, uh, that are implemented by the START program. One of the things that we learned early on was there was a lack of training and capacity. So if you built a team, you still didn't have anybody to do the work. So I could say we have a psychiatrist and a psychologist and a social worker, which is the terminology we use in the US, but we did not have social workers trained in IDDMH. We did not have psychologists capable of doing that work. And we had a dearth of psychiatrists who actually knew how to do the work. So a lot of the work that we developed with Robert Sobner early on was how to train clinicians in best practice, how to learn from people like Angela across the pond, how to maximize our capacity by building capacity within the team and not requiring they come in with that expertise and not assuming that they have that expertise, which, was a, which is a very big mistake. Um, so a lot of training and consultation is required. It is a 24 hour crisis response. It's crisis prevention and intervention and re requires that you're available all the time. The data shows in our research that 25% of the time crisis contacts happen, believe it or not, at night and on the weekend. So uh, families do not plan their crises according to your uh, active calendar of when you're available at 3 p.m. or 2 p.m. And yes, Friday night is a very exciting time for crises. And so you have to be available 25% of the time. It's at night and on the weekends. Um, there are also mechanisms that we put in place. Um, and I will show you what way the cross systems crisis prevention intervention plan sits. I developed that when I was really working on the mental health side and people would end up in hospital um, and they would get some sort of treatment. They would be discharged back to the community, usually Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. Nobody would know what on earth happened in the hospital. The treatment would change. The psychiatrist in, who was providing outpatient care would, would transfer the treatment back to the way he or she had it to begin with the person would go into crisis again and the cycle would continue. Does that happen here? 
Yes, pretty much. So one of the things that we had was we built a mechanism where it's linked together. So if you go in hospital, there's communication about what's going on in the hospital. We have something called linkage coordinators who are trained, skilled tech workforce to help make sure the dots remain connected and lots of stakeholders, first responders, et cetera. We do have from our studies, we do know, for example, that there is in the United States a racial component to who ends up incarcerated, who ends up with the police called, who ends up um, being even diagnosed with schizophrenia, who has IBD. Um, and there is there are racial and ethnic um, components to this that need to be overcome. We need to work on our cultural competency in, in addition to cultural competency and understanding the way people with IDD communicate. So there are 10 elements to the model. It's an interdisciplinary mental health team. We are a mental health team. We're not an IDD team who happens to provide mental health. We are a mental health team. And that's very important to, to, to say that our promotion of mental health the promotion of mental health is right in front of what we're doing. It isn't an add-on. We're not medicating people to control their behavior. We're actually treating mental health issues and emotional dysregulation-related issues and trying to promote emotional well-being. And on each team is a physician, a, doc, a psychologist, social workers, registered nurses, and direct support professionals, all trained in the mental health aspects of IDD, all trained. So we have training mechanisms for physicians as well as direct support professionals. It's person and family focused and really focuses on outreach. Very early research on the model was the first uh, study was when I was, so you'll be like, why is she still involved with this model for like her whole life? I don't know why, it just happened. But when I was doing my doctoral dissertation research, it was the first um, funded research on the model. One of the things that I learned was that, and none of this is shocking, by the way, none of what I say is rocket science, it's all sort of common sense. It's whether or not as professionals, we actually use our common sense <laughs> instead of sort of getting stuck in mechanisms that have no common sense, I think is really the question, right? So um, what I learned was you need to reach out to stress families rather than having them come to you saying call me when you need me to families that are barely holding on will not call you until it's way over the edge of when you need me to when it's a catastrophe so we go to families we reach out outreach reaching beyond the reach of others that is the definition of outreach we do crisis intervention and safety net mobile supports 24 hours a day we believe that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. We need to collaborate. We need to listen to each other. We need to break down the silos. We believe, and our practice, which is evidence-based, the future, Dr. Coelho, she doesn't quite have her PhD yet, but um, Angela gave it to her early. She's getting it in January. Um, <laughs> she will um, talk to you about a lot of the research that we've done but we are a strength activation system of care. So while we need to understand the vulnerabilities that people face, the best way to do crisis prevention and intervention is through activating the innate strengths in everyone, in the person, in their supports, and in the system around them. Um, we, we are very big proponents of positive psychology, the work of Dr. Marty Seligman and his team, um, and we are humanistic approach and we're very system, systemic. We believe that everything happens in the context or ecology in which a person resides. Again, cross systems, crisis prevention and intervention planning is key. We're an evidence informed practice. We have been collecting and analyzing data from the very first day. This was really, I'd say, one of Robert's greatest contributions, Dr. Sogner's greatest contributions was he, as an expert in the field, said that experts in the field really don't know what they're doing. Um, and, and that part of it is we, have, we do not do enough research. We have not studied enough. And what he wanted to do was set up the START model as a, as a laboratory for evaluating best practice. And that's really what we've been since then. And 
it's one of the reasons why we've been able to do such important research. We're in 25 sites across the country or more, and we're able to see the impact of what we're doing and what the teams are doing and what the people that they support need through this evidence-informed data collection and reporting process. Um, we build capacity. There's lots of mechanisms. You, everybody's familiar with the ECHO model. We have a clinical education team approach that was developed by Dr. Ann Hurley uh, that predates the ECHO model. And of course, with my loyalty to Dr. Hurley, I think it's better than the ECHO model, but that's because I love Dr. Hurley. Um, it's a whole person approach. Um, cultural linguistic competency is key. When controlling for all other factors in the United States, if you're African American, you're less likely to um, benefit from some of our practices than other populations, and that can't that is unacceptable. It's completely unacceptable to us. We do feel that it's very important to have a skilled workforce and standards for programs and integrated assessments. Um, and the National Center for Start Services, of which Dr. Uh, Widely oversees the training for the start teams, is a very important part of the um, of the continuation of the mission of START. Um, it's not necessarily required, but definitely helps to move the mission forward. Oh, it's not working. Doing that. So there. <clears throat> when I was developing the research on the model. Everybody kept talking about what is effective services, what is effective services, they were like, it's ineffective. And really, you can have a conversation with somebody about what is effective and be talking about two different things. And so what I did was I, I looked at research on long-term care, uh, really cancer patients, to find out, well, really, what is effective? What are we talking about when we're dealing with chronic care and, and long-term care? And what we're talking about is three things that have to be in alignment simultaneously. And I, of course, wrote AAO outcomes, and Dr. Sogner said, you cannot say AAO, Joni. What kind of a statement is, but who's gonna remember AAO? So he changed it to accountability. Uh, Robert has passed away many years ago, but he's with me as my friend and colleague every time I, I speak. Um, and I must always credit him with inspiring my work. So the first thing that needs to be in place is access. So an access means it's got to be timely and available. And I do a lot of studies in state government around the United States. We just counted up 15 states that um, we've done analysis of. And many policy people will say, oh, we have accessible outpatient therapy. And in fact, I, if I interview people here in the in the UK, in London, they say, oh yes, we have accessible outpatient therapy for people with learning disabilities, but can you get them? Have, is it accessible? Can, is, it, is it provided in a timely fashion? Are there long waits? Is there availability? If, the, if, if it exists, but it is not accessible to all who need them in a timely fashion, it's ineffective. The second is appropriateness. And um, parliament, there's parliamentary committees looking at the appropriateness of what people are receiving right now in the UK. And one of the things that they're receiving right now in the UK is long stays in inpatient psychiatric units with no place to go. So you would say, oh, they have access to a place, right? It's an inpatient unit. But is, does it really match their needs? Does it provide active treatment and the tools they need for a better life? And the answer might be no, in fact. So it is, not in a, it is not effective to give people services or treatment that is not appropriate. There's been a lot of studies about psychopharmacology and the use of psychopharmacology to, to, to change behavior. Is that the appropriate use of medication? Dr. Hasiotis, is that the appropriate use? Generally speaking, no. Generally speaking, no. So as a good psychiatrist, we quantify that. But I would say, for the most part, Dr. Hasiotis does not prescribe drugs to control people. She prescribes medication to treat people. 
So when you start prescribing drugs to control people, it is not appropriate. When you prescribe medication to treat people, then you have a hypothesis in your mind about what it is you're treating. One of the things that happened in, at our clinic with Robert, Dr. Sogner, is people would come in and they'd want a prescription, like that day, fix this person. And he would say, I need a, little, a couple more sessions. And they would walk out mad, angry, because they did not have a prescription. And he felt it was ineffective to medicate people without knowing what you were medicating them for. So that, again, is ineffective care. And it all comes down to, in my opinion, the third A, which is accountability. Are we actually account, who are we accountable to? Are we, and that, and you'll see in, in my little cartoon portrayal, that's always a big question, right? Who are we serving here? And I remember with Dr. Wiley's first team in Tennessee, when I said, you have to be cost effective, they were like, oh, no, no, you shouldn't tell people when you're cost effective. Um, and the truth is, is yes, you do have to be financially accountable. And as I have said before, there's, there, I might go a little bit later. There, there, um, the resources that you need in order to be accountable have to match the access and appropriateness questions. So again, you can't be cost effective by only having one clinic with four physicians when there is no access to clinical services. So it has to all line up, right? So that people are getting what they need when they need it. When people get what they need when they need it, it's actually less expensive than doing it wrong. So keeping people medicate, over-medicated actually causes secondary conditions, health conditions, terrible dysfunction, dependence, on care, caregivers. Um, there's lots of primary and secondary costs associated to poor care. Accountability means we're really trying to be effective in every penny that we spend to make sure that the maximum benefit can be achieved. So here's our first poll. What is the greatest challenge to effective service delivery that you feel you face here in the UK? or London, or wherever it is we are. Is it access? Is it appropriateness? Is it accountability? I think we'll end the poll here. It looks like it looks like people feel like we have a lot of accountability. So here's what's really funny. You can't really have poor access and appropriateness without terrible accountability. So again, it, what what ends up happening, and you have to really think about this as a group, the one place where we have control over is our own accountability. So I challenge all of you to really think about that as you think about how you want to impact services, about how you are personally accountable for the change that you need. A lot of times we'll, we'll be interviewing systems and people will say, well, they're not doing it, or she's not trained, or they don't have it, or they have bad policy, but I'm, I'm doing work too. What am I doing personally to make things better? Where is my accountability? So um, what I'd love to see is 33, 33, 33, because I believe that all three need to be in alignment. So a lot of people think that access is what is needed. Um, and I would say access to bad treatment is no access, is not, in accountability is no access at all. So we in the beginning of START, um, we can stop sharing. Um, in the beginning of START, or maybe I have to stop sharing. Can you do something like that? Um, in the beginning of START, we used to think all we needed was access to inpatient care. And then we got access to terrible inpatient care. And then we were like, oh my God, we gotta get these people out of here. So it's, it's not that simple. It's never that simple. Next slide. 
So we are a public health model approach um, that was developed by the World Health Organization. I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna go very quickly. Um, you need to have tertiary care um, all the way through. And the most important thing is making sure that capacity building of the people themselves, not just the treatment of them, but actually their ability to, uh, to sort of face the challenges in life. It is not a cause and cure approach. It's really an understanding of vulnerabilities and make an accommodation and, understand, and having people a, better able to be, communicate and be understood that really helps with primary intervention that changes the odds for meaning tertiary. The one thing I wanna point out is that the, the more specialized and more emergent your services, the fewer the options you have and the, and the fewer people get access, right? So this is a basic economic principle. If you do not build capacity in the community to change the odds for needing specialists and needing emergency services, you will not be able to serve as many people and you will always be ineffective. Next slide. I just told myself, okay, here's a poll. What are your, what are your three top priorities to improve upon within the current service system. What do you think, in order to be more effective, do you need greater knowledge and expertise and best practices, housing, research, beliefs have to change about the capabilities, in other words, associated with stigma, availability of services and supports, which people seem to believe is a top priority, siloed funding and resources, which is segregated funding and resources, do we need more person-centered care? Do we need more recreational work opportunities for people with IED? Your top three. And once you've answered the poll, if you could please comment in chat about what, why you chose, and Nancy will read out a few of the comments. This is something that you can take to this afternoon's sessions to really talk about what you really feel needs to happen going forward. Any comments, Nancy? No, not yet. <laughs> so 42% said that we need greater knowledge and expertise in best practices. 53% said we need availability of services and supports. I would say that those two are very close cousins, right? Um, and 47% said we need greater capability and our beliefs need to change. I think that that's absolutely true and consistent with what we have in the US. While only 29% of you stated that housing, I'm sorry, research is a priority. One of the things that will change beliefs is research. I think, and research with engagement with people with disabilities themselves as researchers, and, and partners in research itself, which is what we're doing. And Andrea will talk to talk about in a few minutes. It has been the most rewarding experience of my life to work side by side with people with intellectual disabilities and who are autistic, who have mental health service experiences as a research partner. Um, and it is something we're moving forward with in the US um, and other people, other disabilities and illnesses um, have been included, and this is the first time in the U.S. where we're including people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in this way, um, and it has been just a fabulous, um, a, a, just a fabulous way of learning and sharing, and and really moving moving our beliefs forward about the capability and capacity of people. 
Do you have any comments? We did have a few comments. So without challenging stigma and understanding people with intellectual disabilities, how do you know what's needed? Exactly. We need to challenge the stigma. And so one of the things that we highly recommend is strength activation as a focus rather than the treatment of illness, the promotion of well-being. And that will help to challenge and address stigma. So we, we highly recommend being trained in positive psychology and using those adaptive techniques. There's a lot of literature out there in positive psychology. In fact, the last time we were here, we met with um, uh, Dr. Hasiotis's team about po positive psychology. And it, is, and, and it is used here in the UK, but not so much applied to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and certainly can be. Um, and the other thing is, is hearing the voices of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities is a big way to overcome that stigma because they do have a voice. Yes. Okay, so we can close. Next slide. So we're not there yet. Um, in the United States of America, people with IDD continue to experience new, numerous health disparities, including higher rates of mental health symptoms and behavioral challenges compared to their typically developing peers. This is in 2023 with the brilliant Dr. Beasley doing this work since 1980. So <laughs> you cannot change the world. The world, it's one, it's one day at a time, my friends. These difficulties are often misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, undiagnosed, and even when detected, few evidence-based treatments exist. So our friend, Dr. Jared Barnhill, talks about how mental health in general, we're in the dark ages when it comes to medicine compared to other medical practices. We are the last and least developed. And I think having the humility to know that makes, and, and being more curious, will help us to move things forward. So rather than saying, well, we know it because we're trained, rather than saying our training is limited, um, and therefore um, we, we, there's so much, we have much further to go before we're really as helpful as we'd like to be. This gap is translated into the use of costly and ineffective care, resulting in frequent emergency department and psychiatric hospital visits, um, and sometimes long-term stays, poor quality of life, an earlier age of mortality for the population. So we are not there yet. Next slide. What we feel needs to change is to just remind us all, and I try to tell our team, we're a reaction to the disparities that continue, not the solution. However, we can learn from the experiences that we have to help promote solutions-based work. But we are, as long as you need start, as long as you need an active cross-systems crisis system that trains everyone because no one else is getting trained, we're in trouble, right? The, you need to face, we need to all face our biases and the stigma. Every day before you walk in, you need to remember every patient record that you read, everything that you think you know about somebody is loaded with bias. And you just have to remember information and bias are two different things. We need more research. We need First person knowledge, nothing about us without us is a phrase that we use. We don't always follow it, but we should. Cultural and linguistic competency, synergy rather than silos, and cross system solutions. And that comes from a common understanding, um, which a common understanding not just amongst ourselves, but with the people and the families we support. Next slide. And I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Dr. <laughs> Andrea Quill. <laughs> Now, Andrea is a social worker who is a doctoral candidate um, about to complete her dissertation. Um, she is my partner in research and the director of research and quality assurance. And I'm very um, happy that she's here with me today. Andrea. What I'm going to focus on is really how is really the research on the start model um, and how our research is um, how the data has informed practice and how practice has informed the way in which we collect data. Um, one thing that's true about START is that it's always been data informed, always since 1989. I remember Joni joking that they used to collect, they used to have spreadsheets and punch cards, um, and they collected data via DOS. And they wrote annual reports in Karen Wigley's basement in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, and that she had to carry dimes in her pocket if you were on call, if, in case you got a beat, that there was a crisis and you could run to a telephone um, and put a dime in. 
So START has always been data informed. Do you know what a dime is? It's worth nothing. It's very small. Yeah. Yes. Quid is change, right? It's quid, right? And um, I'm just making it up. I don't know. Hence, <laughs> okay. Um, so um, what has, it, it's just gotten a little bit easier. And I think I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm just going to say this out loud that we, it's our ethical responsibility to be evidence informed and to do research. Um, there is a significant, I'm a clinical social worker by training, so I'm a therapist, and there is a significant gap, not so much, not as big as it, as it has been in the past, but there's a significant gap between what we know to be true in clinical practice and research. There's this um, kind of assumption that the two are separate entities and they're working parallel to one another. And it really is our responsibility to bridge that gap um, so that we can, we can learn from what we're doing and we can contribute to the broader knowledge base of effective services and supports for people with IBD. And so um, the way that we collect data at the National Center for START Services is through the START Information Reporting System. Um, it's a, it's a web-based database that's been in place since 2013, and it's utilized by all START programs across the country. We currently have over 15,000 individual service records for people that have received START services since 2013 across the U.S. Um, there's more people that have received services. We just didn't have the database then. Um, and based on what we know in our research, it's one of the largest data sets of its kind, specifically for, I, for IBDMH in the US. And so the SERS uh, database, we collect demographic and intake information, clinical information, so diagnostic information, and service outcomes for every single person enrolled in START. Um, and it requires, and because START programs from across the country, we have probably, gosh, what, do you, what would you say? over 30 START teams across the US, um, it really requires active participation from every single provider. So the way in which we do that is through our quality assurance department. So we monitor the data, we provide reports, and we offer training and technical assistance around how to use that information to inform your practice. Um, so it ends up becoming part of the service delivery system, not just an add-on. Um, and that I think has really helped with regard to missingness um, and that improves our ability to conduct analyses on things that we're curious about and that we know are important for people in their communities. So START is both evidence-informed, and Joni talked a little bit about this. It's both evidence-informed and evidence-based. When we say evidence-informed, we're really talking about the fact that we're a learning community. So we gather data, we use that data and learn from it, we apply that in clinical practice, and then we do it again. So it's this cycle of learning. Um, an example of this recently is um, one thing that we learned was when we start began when services began in the state of California, we learned that um, there was a high rate of suicidality reported at intake among children in the state of California. This was much higher than what we had seen in other locations. And so what that did was it, it informed us. We were curious about that. What does that mean for our communities? Is this something that's happening elsewhere, but just not being reported? So there were a number of questions that we were able to ask ourselves when we identified those trends. We then were able to design training for the California START teams that influenced the way that work was being done across the nation. And those, and those START teams can then offer that information to their communities. So that's capacity building. That's that World Health Organization sort of framework, right? The primary services. That's, um, that's how we're evidence-informed. And we actually developed the 988 curricula so that in the United States, there's a 988 hotline um, for mental health crises across the country. It's, a, it's, a, it's one number except New York because New York never cooperates with like anybody. Stuff. But um, I'm a New Yorker. <laughs> and under Dr. Wiley's leadership, we developed a training on how to engage people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who may call on that hotline. Um, how do you talk to people? How do you listen to them? How do you know? Um, and so we developed a training that's being used around the country for the 988 hotlines. Yes, it's a free national number. It's a relatively new, I would say, within the last couple of years. But because of what we learned, we knew that there was a gap and we were able to design supports to fill that gap. 
And START is also evident, an evidence-based practice. So that means that there's demonstrated effectiveness, which is supported by the research. And that's what I'll talk through a little bit here. I'll share some, some studies. Across the US, we see improvements in three, in, in a number of, of areas, but three key outcome areas. Improved rates of stabilization following mental health crisis, reduced psychiatric hospitalization and emergency department use, and improved satisfaction with mental health services in general, not just satisfaction with START services, but satisfaction with mental health services as a whole, because START is a linkage model. So by making those linkages, everybody in the system becomes more accountable to the person that they're supporting and their family. So what I'm going to do is go through what I think are four seminal studies around recent studies around crisis related research and START. There's a number of publications on um, the National Center for START Services website that are prior to that occurred prior to this, but I'm just going to focus on four recent ones. Um, but please feel free to, to take a look around there. And all the data was collected and analyzed through the SERS database. So this first study was published in 2016, and this um, study focused on psychiatric hospitalization and factors that impact psychiatric hospitalization among individuals with IDD referred to START. Our sample here was over 3,200 people that were served by STARS. So that's the benefit of having a database is that our, um, we're able to really look at um, outcomes across diverse geographic areas. We have, we start as provided in urban and rural settings. We're able to see differences in um, diverse socio-demographic areas, including race and ethnicity, um, and also clinical areas and, like diagnosis. And so what we learned from this study, and none of this is news, you know, Joni said that early on in, in, in the study of START, um, we had a similar finding that more than one in four people referred to START were psychiatrically hospitalized in the last year. Those that identified as Black or African American were 37% more likely to be psychiatrically hospitalized than those who identify as white, non-Hispanic. And a lack of waiver supports was associated with an increased likelihood of hospitalization. So what waiver supports are in the US are essentially additional state or federal funding that should, in theory, um, provide greater access to community supports. Not necessarily that there are community supports, but that, they're, that the person has funding. I don't know why that did that. I didn't even say it. Um, my phone just went off and I don't want to say her name because it'll go off again. Um, so um, so this, is, this is what people were identifying as housing and jobs, right? So waiver supports in the US help to get people housing and vocational training and jobs. And accessibility And services. accessibility services. So 41%, um, it, it increased the likelihood that they would end up in hosp psychiatric hospitals if they didn't have those supports. So again, mm -hmm. there, you're seeing the intersectionality between the services. And what is interesting is that there's variability in terms of access to these services across states. So it's not consistent across the country there are locations that have different um, levels of access where, so for New York, in New York, for example, almost everybody in Golden Start has some sort of waiver. In North Carolina, only about 20% do. So there's a major access, access disparity. So remember that study was people prior to coming to Start. So that's the Start referral population mm -hmm. versus the what happens after they're in Start. And this is the same. This is this second study um, was focused on psychotropic use among youth ages five to twenty-one with IDD upon enrollment into START. And here's what we learned. Again, no shocker, um, because a lot of what we're talking about is not necessarily rocket science. It's common sense. We just have to make space in our brains to think about it. Eighty-six percent of this sample, I think it was about eleven hundred children um, were receiving at least one psychiatric medication. 65% of those were prescribed antipsychotic. 33 were prescribed an anticonvulsant without evidence of a seizure disorder. So while we don't know exactly why they were prescribed an anticonvulsant, 
we can assume based on the research that it was for off-label, um, it was an off-label use to address irritability, aggression, behavior. 55% um, were receiving three or more psychiatric medications. Um, and the older you were, so that transitional age period, right, 16 to 21, the more likely they were to be prescribed three or more psychiatric meds. And if you're living, if they were living in a group home, that increased the risk as well. So what this study, these two studies provided very important um, information about who was being referred to start and what, what the characteristics are of people that were referred to, referred to start. And also links, I think, polypharmacy with an increase in, um, and an increase in, in psychiatric hospitalization. So more meds don't answer the problem or don't solve the problem. And so this study, experiences with the mental health service system for family caregivers of individuals referred to start. This was again, a look at intake. What was happening when people came to start? And what, um, what the researchers here looked at was 488 surveys of family caregivers of people who were being referred to start. We completed what's called a family experiences interview schedule, which, is, um, which was developed by Tesler and Gamachi in 1996 and has been used within START for some time. Um, and what that survey does is it elicits perspectives and experiences. What was it? Since 1998. 98, I got it wrong. No, so we did. No, oh. you had it right. Oh, okay. We started using it in 1998. We started using it in 1998. So 488 families were, we, we analyzed data from 488 surveys. And what they said was that family members said they do not have assistance when they need it in times of crisis. And they don't know who to call if they need help. And 75% said they did not have help at night or on the weekends. So big shocker, they, the families can't plan a crisis around our schedules and they need help when they need help. They need it in real time. The FEIS also has two open-ended questions. Um, and so we were able to analyze the qualitative responses to those questions. One question is if you, um, are there any services that you felt your family member needed that you were unable to access? And two, what do providers need to know? What else do they need to know about mental health care for people with IBD? And this is what families said. I don't want to place my son outside of the house. I don't know what else to do. The system has failed me. I don't want an over-medicated zombie of a child. What is really interesting about this FEIS, as Joni mentioned, it's been used in START since 1998. We have completed hundreds and hundreds, thousands of FEIS surveys. We've also interviewed hundreds of thousands, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of community providers. When you ask community providers what they think is needed in the system, they say beds, please. They need places, they need group homes, they need beds, 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 beds. Less than 1% of family members interviewed using this FEIS survey said, we need a bed which tells me that family members, if they could have access to the community supports that they needed, if they knew who to call in an emergency, that they would much rather have their loved one home with them than in a bed somewhere. They want them in their own bed, right? I say with my children, I want all my chickens home, right? My, I call my chicken, I want them all home under my roof, right? Um, I am no different than any other family member, you know? So that's something I think that is really critical to the work that we do. I want my, my chickens are no longer there. Your chickens are out. Now. I'll get to a point where I'll want them that out. Is. But I, I still, yes. yes. They're all the <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so this is the last study that I will share with you. Um, this, was com this was completed in 2021. And what we focused on here were predictors of mental health crises among those enrolled in START. So once enrolled in START, we know all of these things that increase the likelihood. Once enrolled in START, what does it look like in terms of crisis service use? So START providers offer 24-7 crisis response 
telephonically and in person. So they get a call when, and, and what start teams are, are trained to do is to say, help is on the way, we're coming. So what you'll see here is a, is a chart. There's a fancy name for this chart, which I don't know um, what it is. But once I get, once I get, yes, by January I will. But um, so this fancy, fancy chart essentially shows that there's a spike or an increase in, there's a, the highest level of crisis contacts within START is within the first three months of enrollment. And then you see a steady decrease after that. It's amazing when people know that there's help and they trust that someone's gonna answer the phone, they're more likely to call. Um, and so these people are calling and they're sharing very vulnerable things about what is happening in their homes. And so that's very brave. Um, so that's really what that's demonstrating. And we see a decrease over time. About half of crises happen after six months and very few happen after one year. So within the first nine months, that's the most likely time that folks enrolled in START will, will experience a crisis. And that is where, so we, we can provide that crisis response, that tertiary level of care. And as time goes on, we have more opportunity to build what's strong and to do strength activation and to help people engage in their communities and to strengthen these linkages so that we can help them prevent these crises in the future and change this pattern. So one thing that we did not say is people do not remain in START permanently. So the average length of stay in a START program is about 15 months. Mm -hmm. And during <laughs> COVID, we checked in with everyone because we thought they might be in crisis. And our recidivism rate was less than 2%. So one, people, once people knew what they were doing or what to do, they were able to manage it and did not need additional help from START. So we felt... That was a very positive uh, finding. Mm -hmm. And that's where you see the third bullet here. So three out of four contacts to the start crisis line, a person was able to maintain, able to maintain their setting, which essentially means they were able to stay, to stay home. Um, so when help is provided, we can prevent hospitalization. One major protective factor that we found in this study was that when the start enrollee was employed, the likelihood of crisis was reduced significantly, it was reduced by half. So um, that's a major protective factor against crisis, at least in this sample, which was um, almost 1,200 people. So in summary, we know that prior to start or upon enrollment to start, we see a few things. We see an over-reliance on, on hospitalization. 28% um, of folks upon enrollment had experienced hospitalization in the year prior and an over-reliance on psychotropic medication, particularly polypharmacy, and that families want to avoid these, um, these crises experiences as much as possible. We also identify that upon intake, there's large gaps in crisis services within community settings, particularly at nights and on the weekends. And when, when people have access to these services, they're less likely to experience crises as time goes on. So there's a need to improve community supports. And again, um, we can't just focus on wellness or focus on the problem. We have to recognize the problem, fill that gap, but then do something to make sure that that gap doesn't get bigger later on. I'm going to give you um, a, a service example. What does it look like when somebody actually is enrolled in a START program and receives START services? And I want to start by thanking Joni, the author of the START model, um, for sharing her creation, one of her babies, with us and her expertise. And to Mike Marzo, who was a member of, he just recently, um, stopped being a member of one of the New York START teams. He was on Long Island. And um, he presented this case to me in 2017. Um, and he has allowed me to use this. This was somebody that I also um, consulted with him about during the period that he provided services. So this person is Barbara. Um, Barbara is biologically a male but identifies as female and obviously prefers to be known as Barbara and addressed with female pronouns. 
Um, when Barbara was referred to the START program, she was 22 and lived in a group home with five other people. She went to a day program where sometimes they were at this site. Um, I'm not exactly sure what they, I, I guess I'm being um, a they little judgmental. Didn't, they didn't do a lot there. They kind of hung out. Um, and they did that sometimes and other times they'd go out to the community and, and engage in something more active. So that was good. Um, Barbara was very close with her parents and her younger twin brothers. And although she lived in a group home, she visited with them very often. She was referred to start for, for these reasons. These are not, um, these are in the words of the people who made the referrals, right? So they were concerned about her sexualized behavior towards her housemates and her staff, um, and people were not consenting. Um, she could become physically aggressive when upset, uh, but she, they needed help with what's going on with diagnostics, with treatment planning, and understanding her mental health symptoms and how she presented. So these are the conditions under which Barbara was at her best. So when there's a good, consistent, predictable routine, when, when her house was quiet or the day program was more quiet and less stimulating, um, when people were patient and calm with her, um, she, she really preferred speaking to one person at a time. She did better with one-on-one -on -one situations than in groups. And she did, did do really well expressing herself verbally. So giving her the time to do so was really important for her. And for people presenting things in a positive manner to her, instead of like, no, stop or cut it out or you're doing this wrong again, right? Um, obviously visiting with her family and doing things she prefers. You know, the vast majority of these, maybe not everybody likes a quiet environment, I don't know. Um, but the vast majority of these, right, all, could apply to anyone, <laughs> all of us, any one of us, not shocking. So what we do is the first thing, one of our first assessments when somebody is enrolled into START is um, a character strength survey. So we, we look to identify what are the essential ingredients about this human being um, and, that are the good in them. What is the best in them and how do they use those in everyday interactions? So she was very humble. She showed a lot of humility. She's very creative, funny, um, had a good sense of humor, very kind. Barbara was very kind. She had some good skills around self-regulation, persistence, um, hanging in there despite some very difficult things that she had experienced in her life and hope. She was always hopeful. Um, so she was this resilient person. Um, her skills, she had excellent memory for certain things. Her verbal communication skills were really good. And, and expressive, I will say, expressive verbal communication. Receptive, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, she does a good job with following schedules. She is a good reader and she can operate some appliances and cook simple meals for herself. She also used to work at a gym cleaning the equipment and really enjoyed them. She was interested in music, especially Celine Dion, um, Golden Girls, walking outside, spending time near the ocean where they did live near the ocean, um, dressing up and using makeup very artistic with that, very good at that, um, and going to some of her favorite places in her local community. So these were her diagnoses at referral. Her psychiatric diagnoses included schizoaffective disorder, which had been diagnosed when she was 20. Um, gender dysphoria disorder had been diagnosed just that year, and she was diagnosed with autism when she was three years old. Um, her level of intellectual disability was moderate, um, and she also had obesity and constipation, which she had suffered for almost 10 years. Um, so what was she taking? What were her medications? She was on clozapine, despite having already experienced neutropenia um, and it contributing to her constipation and weight gain. So she'd been on that for three years and lithium for three years. Um, Ativan was used before dental appointments um, for sedation for her. And that was only started a couple of years ago. Colace and Fibercon, which are, um, I don't know if you have those here, but those are for <laughs> constipation. 
Okay, vulnerabilities. So what we mean when we talk about vulnerabilities are what are some of the things about us or about our history or past that might predispose us to experience crisis at some point or another. So for Barbara, that was anxiety related to her autism, sometimes having difficulty um, forming and maintaining close relationships um, and, and boundaries. So she, she sometimes tried a little too hard and went a little too close for people too quickly. Um, receptive communication. So I mentioned she's very good at talking. She didn't always understand um, what she was hearing as well, which can be really difficult if people don't know that. Um, because people say, oh, well, Barbara, she, she knows what she's talking about. She knows what I said. She should understand this. Why does she keep doing X, Y, or Z when she can say it out loud that she shouldn't or won't? Um, however, she wasn't able to always understand things that were said, even if she could repeat them. Um, a lot of hard times with transitions and changes in routine, changes in staff or something different happening at home. And um, she had a hard time, I mean, who wouldn't, right? With, with the way that some people responded to her gender identity. And, you know, immediately the START team started to wonder, you know, how much of what she's experiencing could be trauma related. So at um, Intake, we also create eco maps of the person's system. The dotted lines are strained relationships. The solid lines are good ones, um, strong with flexible boundaries. And you can see the arrows point whether this is a reciprocal or a service related um, relationship. Barbara was always very, very close with her mother. Um, harder time with her father and brothers and group home. Um, and you can see the MSC is, is like a case manager, service coordinator type person. Um, and her day program, she did pretty well there. A therapist, she had a therapist, a psychiatrist. But you can also see who's talking to who in there, who even has a relationship. Um, not everybody involved, right? There's kind of this little subsystem over here um, that knows and talks to one another. And then there are these outliers. So one of the first things that the team noticed was that Barbara's presentation didn't necessarily match her diagnostic um, profile. So they started to question and worked with their medical director and their psychologist to say, what's going on and does this look like this person? Um, so things that they began to notice were that um, her mood episodes were sporadic and not uninterrupted, her delusions and disorganized behavior. Um, Mike started to think this is probably more likely due to executive functioning um, problems group, relates to anxiety, right? And trauma response, because that's when we saw these differences were when she was in an increased state of anxiety. Um, no evidence of any real delusions or hallucinations for two weeks. Um, the major mood episode part of this, some of her symptoms, was really intermittent in nature. So it, it really wasn't meeting the criteria for schizoaffective disorder. And one of the things that the START team did, they don't just go in and say, well, my medical director said um, that's wrong, right? <laughs> what they would do is meet with the, the system of support around her. So everyone we saw in that eco map and talk about what does she present like? You know, like I personally usually coach people don't even put schizoaffective disorder up, put up criteria and start talking about this. And does that sound like Barbara? Oh, let's cross that one out. What about this? And what about that? And everybody has a say, and that's how you learn about what her presentation may really look like. Um, making sure that you have caregivers and family members who know her well to help um, help provide that information so that you can begin to influence how everybody understands her, right? Um, same with gender dysphoria. So previously she'd been diagnosed with sexual and gender identity disorder. That's a, that's a term from the DSM-4. Um, change to gender dysphoria with the DSM-5. Um, and so, Really, her impairments in social and other functioning 
there, there's some complicating presentation here, right? So Barbara has autism. She has some difficulties that. Um, and also when other people are responding poorly to you um, and not respecting your identity, um, you're gonna have these problems, right? So it, it's, it just seemed like this was not a great diagnosis. It's stigmatizing. Um, and undermining everyone's efforts to, uh, to help her embrace her identity in a positive way and to make sure everybody else did as well, right? So other things, other things, autism, um, again, she was diagnosed at age three and everybody thought, yeah, that seems correct. We see that. Um, her adaptive testing had been done just two years before. Um, and was at 47. So her highest scaled scores were in vocational skills and health and safety, and her lowest were in leisure, social, community use, and self-care, which is often common for people with autism. Um, and her psychological testing was also two years prior. So you can see where she did better was verbal comprehension and, and then lower around perceptual reasoning, reasoning, working memory, and processing speed. So remembering that those three things impact your receptive language a lot, um, even if you have a strong verbal knowledge base, taking in information and using it, holding it. Um, executive functioning challenges that she experienced. So the test showed a lot of difficulty, we said, with working memory. Of it. Well, not obviously, but for a lot of people with autism, cognitive flexibility is different, um, shifting from topic to topic to concept. Organizing and planning, she needed a lot of support around that. And inhibition, she was often impulsive, um, particularly emotionally impulsive. So again, this team thought, you know, we kind of wonder about the, the impact of trauma on Barbara and how much that might help shed light on what we are seeing um, and what she's experiencing and her ongoing crisis. So um, we know that you know, research indicates that there's a high frequency of potentially traumatic events that are experienced by people with, who are transgender. Um, high incidence of PTSD, depression, and what's not mentioned there is suicidality. And she did indeed experience a lot of depressive symptoms and suicidal ideation during her teen years. Um, she, she was exploring sexually and people in her environment were framing that as wrong and inappropriate behavior. Um, so people were reporting her um, even for maybe things, looking at things on her phone, that sort of thing. And then there would be all these investigations going on for the group home about what she's doing and is this correct or not? And is she a danger to others? Um, very traumatic for her. Um, and she had been hospitalized a lot. Um, and I think five, five times during childhood and, and in her teen years, which again, is likely traumatizing as well being hospitalized psychiatrically. So what are some of the biological factors? We look at a biopsychosocial um, understanding of the person too um, in the beginning. So somebody earlier mentioned and asked, what do you do about physical health? Absolutely. Um, oftentimes our START teams uncover um, unknown, unreported or untreated medical problems. Um, that the person may be experiencing so that we can ensure that that is not one of the main causes for a crisis, which oftentimes it is. So um, her mother reported having preterm fibroids during her pregnancy and she had to take medications. Um, we didn't know why she didn't remember what it was, um, but to prevent early delivery and loss of the baby. Um, Barbara had a lot of ear infections during childhood, um, history of the low white blood cell, the cause of neutropenia. Um, she had been tried on 15 different psychotropic medications as a child. Um, that's a lot in childhood. And a lot of them were the antipsychotics and um, 
seizure medications. Constipation and obesity, right? Also important. So psychological factors. So there is a, a very strong family history of anxiety and depression, um, language delays, autism, emotional dysregulation really started when Barbara was like four and five years old and her behavioral health symptoms escalated to physical aggression by the time she was five. Um, and as I mentioned, five psychiatric hospitalizations during childhood and adolescence. And she's just had a lot of anxiety even since childhood, um, along with suicidal ideation, difficulty with coping skills and managing her anger over the years. Um, and we mentioned these other things, but her gender identity, of course, is, has been a challenge, not so much for her as for her community and her family. Um, and she had an LGBT therapist that was really helping her with that. So social factors, again, difficulty with making friends and ended up preferring to be alone. I don't know if she really always did. I think that some of her experiences um, trying to interact with people caused her to withdraw more um, and then just decide I'd rather not try. Um, again, though, very close with her family. She had been at a residential school out of her own state um, and returned back home in 2016. So just a year prior to her being referred. Um, again, she was in the support group. She had the therapist. I think there's a lot of repetitive <laughs> points here, um, but you can see she, she did. These are the things that contributed to the challenges she was experiencing some of the social factors. Um, so what did the START team do? What does the START team do about that? Besides do those assessments in the beginning to find out what's happening for her, what has happened in her past, what's happening in her um, system of support, what do we do now, right? We, we begin with systemic consultation. So using um, structural strategic family therapy techniques, um, these are some of those that the team used to engage both Barbara, but also the group home, the family, the day program, trying to get working to open communication among the entire system and those subsystems, um, ensuring that everybody understood Barbara in the same way. So one of the things that we often see is people say, well, she's attention seeking, that's why she's doing this. Or, you know, she's putting on all that makeup just for attention seeking, those sort of things. Um, so we, we use a lot of reframing. Um, one example around that attention seeking would be that she's connection seeking, right? Attention seeking is, okay, that's very vague. What does that mean? You're trying to get something from somebody. So we look at what kind of connection, what are you wanting a response? Do you want people to notice you? that's fine, right? That's an okay thing. So we, we helped this team think differently about her sexually inappropriate behavior, the attention seeking, her gender confusion. No, she was not confused. Other people were confused, right? Um, so really helping people to gradually understand that and change, shift their beliefs. Um, around that and, and de-triangulating some of those subsystems. Remember that original um, ego map, the day program was out of it, right? It was the family and her and the group home and they, they had their own thing going, but completely left out any other providers and the day program in particular. So that was, that's a real focus of the work. And again, it's a process, it's not a day, it's several days, it's meeting, it's re-meeting, it's gradually shifting how people think and interact. Um, again, with the diagnostics, right? Looking at that a little bit differently, um, building empathy, shaping competence for people, um, and engaging that day program. So we unbalanced the system that liked to be where it was, right? It was nice and comfortable where, how they've always interacted and the day program was kind of like, that's fine. We don't have, we don't care. She's fine here, we're good. But what we 
needed was for them to share what they were learning about her and how was, when she did well, what was going on? How did you do that? How did you support her? Um, so all of those strategies were used. This is the eco map of after, um, after the START program was engaged. Um, this is about a year after. So you can see that there's a support group now, um, the day program and the START program and the therapist are much better engaged with the rest of the service providers um, and the mother, the father and, bro I mean, the brother should be on the outside of their children, um, but the father still a little bit strained. Um, but you can see that the psychiatrist too was, they were having a little harder time getting the psychiatrist on board with considering um, diagnostic clarification and maybe medication changes for Barbara. Everybody is afraid of that usually, especially for somebody who'd been on 15 trials in childhood, right? Um, and who'd been in and out of the hospital multiple times. And she was her most stable, according to most people in her, in her service system. So people were afraid to mess with that. So you saw this earlier. So what did the START team do with regard to these things? Also important. So primary was that consistent outreach with the system. As Joni mentioned earlier, not waiting for somebody to call in a crisis, but I'm gonna to continue to go out and hang out and get to know you. You're gonna remember me, you're gonna like me. Um, and that way we can work together better. Um, providing training on autism and gender identity and expression and sexuality for people with IDD, executive function differences for everyone in that system really helped because they were really Kind of picking on those things instead of understanding the bigger perspective of where Barbara was coming from. Um, also the linkage I showed you already with the support group, right? She also started working with the nutritionist. She was interested in losing weight and getting healthier and feeling better. Um, the START team advocated for wellness activities, getting her in the community, um, engaging at a gym. Um, also they held a case presentation with the full START team that resulted in what, what Joni mentioned earlier, the clinical education team. It's for the START team, but it's also for the community. It's a learning forum like de-identified. Um, but it resulted in a lot of good insight and suggestions from community members that were then taken back to Barbara's system of support and addressed. So what do we do? This is a good suggestion. Let's, let's act on this. Um, the secondary services, the specialized services were those crisis planning meetings. So when I, when I described the systemic engagement and the systemic um, strategies that were used, all of that was done in the context of developing a plan that says who will do what when. What does a crisis look like for Barbara? How do we know when it's an early stage? What do we do to help in that situation? What contributed to it? That'll help us know how to address it. What does a middle stage of crisis look like? What is the worst part of a crisis look like? And then who are we? Who are we calling? What are we doing? And it's an agreement among everybody in this person's life and system that says, yes, I agree. When you call me, I will do this to be helpful. Um, so that is, that is the main tool of the START model. That's the one that Joni mentioned that she developed early on um, from the beginning maybe even before start was the cross systems crisis plan so that everybody knew it was a well-oiled machine, right? Everybody knows what to do when. Um, what I will mention is that for um, all the work with start is to decrease the occurrence of mental health crises for people. Sometimes despite everyone's best, best efforts, somebody may have a manic episode. Somebody may still have a psychotic episode, whatever that may be, may become suicidal despite everyone's best efforts. The other thing that we try to do is ensure that the rest of the system doesn't go into crisis with the person, right? Mm -hmm. So that everybody knows, no, I know what to do now. It's not as scary. I'm not freaking out. I'm not just gonna like 
without thinking because I can't think because I'm too stressed, just take this person to, to this place or drop them off when I might have a better plan. I do have a better plan. So um, ongoing consultation with Barbara's psychiatrist, even after a year, that was still a little strained, but I think he was, he was coming around a little bit um, and, and consulting with the clinical and medical director. And they were also working with um, psychiatrist. They used some other service planning tools that we had um, and action plan meetings. Tertiary care, again, that's the crisis response, right? So um, the team provided start emergency on call. So call in a crisis, we, the team members respond in person. The benefit of that and the purpose, it's not necessarily to come in and be, you know, magic wand or hold somebody or stop them from whatever they're physically doing. It is to come in and use what we know about that person, what are their strengths, skills, and interests to try and shift this situation immediately to help the other people who are also upset to regain their balance and stability before we leave and help people repair, do a little bit of relationship repair and have a plan before we leave and determine, do we leave? Or are we, does this person truly need a different level of care right now. Um, so it also really helps inform that crisis plan because as an outside person, when the START team mobilizes and responds to a crisis, they can try different things. Like I have a hypothesis I think might help Andrea in these situations, I'm gonna try it and see. So it helps to inform the crisis plan too. It's a feedback loop. Um, you saw the, the the um, graph that, that Andrea showed earlier about the crisis response, absolutely true with her. Very high frequency of crisis calls in the six, first six months. And then after that, none, none. Um, so also this team collaborated with first responders because sometimes so, so can I just say, no fault. Can I just say, yes. those six months are not, we finally broke her in. So it's, we, we changed our methods. So it's learning from our own mistakes. Yep. I feel like sometimes we feel like if we repeat the same thing over and over again, we will come up with a different outcome. If we just hang in there, like if one med doesn't work, we'll try two or seven. It isn't really the case. We try to learn from our failure to be effective and try to change the methods we use to be more effective. And I think that's very important. That's what we do in the six months. It isn't just waiting her out, like breaking in a pony or something. Well, I <laughs> right. no. that's what it is. I think that's a really important point that you're making. <laughs> so, and it's it's really kind of what I was trying to describe with the crisis calls, right? Is that you are, it is real time um, trial and error. And it, yeah, no. It's not that the start team members have some magical knowledge that other people don't, but they're trained on how to have good hypotheses, how to keep trying and, and to persevere even when we screwed up, right? So it's absolutely true. And thank you for saying that. <laughs> so another important part was collaborating with other first responders because neighbors would often call the police, even if the team didn't want to call the police in on this situation because they knew the start team was coming. So they had to get to know the couple of officers who tended to come most often. Um, the START team got to know them, helped them, pulled them in with the START planning, the crisis planning, right? And, and to know what to do and how to approach Barbara differently so that they weren't inadvertently escalating the situation, which often happened like with housemates, staff, and even the police were inadvertently whipping things up, making them more challenging. So very important to in include our first responders. Um, they also taught a lot about a trauma-informed approach and what that means and how to do that. And I'm fairly sure you all here use this quite a bit. <laughs> more and more, I suppose, or as people come in services and things. Yes, yes. So it, it's that instead of, um, coming in to manage 
the first priority is safe and including the person who might be looking like the least safe person here. They are responding to something, right? Instinctively, um, if you think about it, they are just responding probably from a, a place of fight, flight, freeze. Um, and so how do you help bring that down immediately? So a lot of these and, and building trust, right? And using people's strengths to bring them out, back out of that into, into a calm place. Um, focusing on choices to help people feel like more powerful, even, even in the most challenging situations in your life. Um, and again, I mentioned building and enhancing relationships, very important, along with the trauma-informed, of course, we use the positive psychology to do that so that there is mutual respect. We don't only identify um, the character strengths of the person who is enrolled in START, we do that with their entire family, with people at their group home, with people at the day program. We teach them to strength spot one another, to point out, like, I noticed you did this earlier and I so appreciate your kindness. You're a kind person, I can tell. So that also the person who's enrolled has the opportunity to give back and engage in meaningful ways. Oftentimes it's more about, well, what do you do to or for this person instead of how do we help them um, grow and give more? Um, which I just, that was it. Okay, <laughs> I just described that. I got ahead of myself, um, ahead of my slides. But it included in the strengths-based approaches and wellness was working with the nutritionist, she was beginning to learn how to cook and prepare healthier meals for herself and her housemates. She was exercising a lot more, enjoying being outside, got her to the beach more frequently, which definitely motivated her to walk. Um, help again with the reframing, more opportunities and joining groups of like-minded people. So what, what did all that accomplish? These were some of the things that were seen. Um, so a, a tremendous decrease in behavioral health symptoms, but especially her, her being so upset that she became aggressive, which if, you know, what we saw that as was a trauma response. That was a fight or flight and Barbara's a survivor, so she fought. Um, and so she stood her ground. So we really helped to decrease not only her reactivity to that by help teaching her some skills through coaching, but also to help the rest of the team know this is happening and how do we help her right now? Or how do we not do it in the first place if we inadvertently provoked that, right? There was, um, there were decreases in the psyche ER visits with none after six months. Um, and there had been five in the year before. So the ER is the emergency room, the emergency department. Right? Um, she was again in the support group, eating better, regular team meetings, as you saw on that eco map, it's a good representation that people were actually talking to each other and had developed relationships with one another um, and kept that communication open. Everybody seemed to understand her a little bit different, almost everybody. <laughs> no offense to the psychiatrist, it was just her, this particular situation. <laughs> um, but there, most everybody was really understanding. Um, Barbara and they, they got rid of the diagnosis of gender dysphoria because they were like, well, now that we are accepting you and we treat you differently, we see that this is really more about us than it was about um, Barbara. And they stopped with the one-on-one -on -one staffing for, for quite some time because Barbara was a risk and hurt people and a, a sexual predator. You know, all these, these sort of myths around her um, were dispelled and she was able to be her best self. They didn't need to have that one-on-one -on -one person with her, which I'm sure also contributed to her being her better self. And if you feel like people are constantly watching you, I would think that would make you question your own ability to, um, to regulate yourself. So um, the system was trained. They were using that crisis plan. 
really independently, as, as we noted after six months, the last six months, they didn't even need to call. They would tell you the next day, oh, we used it. Here's what we did, it worked. Um, they also worked very closely with um, her. She had an ABA therapist, um, applied behavior analyst. And so they worked around a behavior support plan to bring that more into line instead of ignoring when Barbara was attention seeking, it was more connecting when Barbara was connection seeking, right? So, so kind of shifting how people addressed her and responded to her made it much more consistent with the crisis plan. Um, and I think this is the next steps, but I can't see the beginning. I wonder if we can push that up and look where sure it lies Okay, sorry people. Yes, this was the next. I'm sorry, I couldn't see the top of my slide, but I assumed this is where we were. So what what did the team have left to do? Remember, this was about 12 months in um, to Barbara's enrollment. So they were going to continue to work with her therapist and psychiatrist, which is often there are some barriers in our system to doing that, in that um, most psychiatrists and therapists can't get paid for the time that they spend talking to other people, collaborating. So if you aren't, if that person isn't in this room and we're not having, you know, our 20 minute appointment, I'm losing money. Um, and so that's a hard thing to overcome. Um, and we have to be real creative about how do we do that and how do we make it worth people's time to engage. Um, oftentimes, I will say by the start team, one of the start team members going to those appointments with the person, with Barbara and her family. Um, they were continuing to try and um, look at that schizoaffective diagnosis and looking at the medication um, and working on that action plan that came out of the, the community forum. Again, with advocacy for wellness-based activities, getting Barbara more engaged in the community, less of the sitting at the day program, um, and ongoing outreach with everybody, um, and, and everything else. Again, a further exploration. They did want to look at trauma history, although there was a lot of, sorry, hypotheses about that. Um, just looking into it more 